Hello and welcome. And today I'm very pleased to be talking to Professor Naz. Now, Naz is a professor of experimental psycho. Oh, I knew I was going to mess this one. Psychopathology at the University of Reading and the founder and director of the Brick Centre, which is building resilience in breast cancer. Now, I came across, I was going to say, I came across NAS. I came across NAS because I was reading some research papers um, on some research that she's recently done around chemo brain. Now, chemo brain refers to cognitive problems um, like forgetfulness, difficulty concentrating, lapse in everyday attention, which are common side effects of breast cancer treatments because the research that NAS did were on people with breast cancer. Um, and in particular, looking at um, the effect chemotherapy has on one's brain. Um, and it is quoted that the psychological costs of chemo brain together with the increased risk of uh, clinical anxiety and depression among, are amongst the highest documented in research. So a, a very powerful area to be looking at because it affects so many people. And I think particularly, and as we, we talk with Naz, we'll hear about the research she's done. It's not just the research that she's done now, but the research that's going to be happening in the future, because this will look into the effects of actually general brain fog as well for many people, whether it be from chemotherapy or from a condition or if it could just be, as we know, um, brain fog that one gets from menopause or from MS. So there's the the hopefully the results that will come through this research will will be groundbreaking and supportive of so many people. So after that long waffle, Naz, welcome. Thank you so much. Hello to you, and um, I'm very honoured uh, to be able to um, uh, have a chat with you about this and um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you thank you for finding me, as you said earlier. Um, I'm Nazanin Derekshan, as, as, as you mentioned earlier, and um, I'm um, a cognitive neuroscientist by training. And what does that mean? It means that I've um, studied the brain um, to understand um, what factors can make us vulnerable to um, emotional disorders like anxiety and depression, and how can we target those factors um, to reduce emotional vulnerability and boost resilience. So resilience is something that we all need, we all want to have in everyday life and also in circumstances um, that are quite challenging, like um, a breast cancer diagnosis, for example, a life-threatening um, uh, diagnosis, a life-changing uh, diagnosis. Um, I became interested in um, building resilience in women with breast cancer diagnosis after my own uh, diagnosis of breast cancer. Um, it was a complete shock. Um, I was in my 30s and my daughter was just under three years of age. Um, I went through the whole shebang um, and a whole year of treatment, um, as many would know, leaves you quite vulnerable uh, emotionally and cognitively. Um, now, a lot of my research prior to me being diagnosed with breast cancer had shown that um, uh, some of our, co like the brain's cognitive systems, um, uh, something that I've liked to ca call the news a lot in my work, but we refer to as attention control, which is the ability to uh, flexibly direct our attention towards relevant and away from irrelevant material and be able to be flexible in our approach to know when something needs attending to, when something needs to be Kind of put aside um, and uh, be able to flexibly switch between task demands. So the cognitive system's flexibility uh, is impaired in individuals who um, suffer anxiety and depression. And um, we had targeted those uh, mechanisms of attention control using interventions that um, exercised 
uh, flexibility exercise. Um, you know, if you think about the brain as a muscle, it's like exercising the muscle in the right places. You know, for for um, for it to be supple and um, uh, be able to adapt, be able to change. Um, so uh, the interventions that we kind of developed and built on. Um, uh, managed to exercise uh, those systems that we were interested in and as a result they had um you know the, this kind of uh change this neuroplasticity induced change um and by neuroplasticity i mean the ability of the brain to change build new synapses get rid of bad ones um deliver better ones reinforce good ones um that neuroplasticity induced change um improved um uh connectivity between the cognitive systems and the emotional systems in the brain and <clears throat> kind of somewhat had a, an empowering effect on individuals um, uh, in terms of managing anxiety and depression. Unfortunately, the breast cancer world, um, uh, uh, the literature shows that um, women with a breast cancer diagnosis are at a high risk of anxiety and depression as well as PTSD. And breast cancer diagnosis and um, treatment um, weighs heavy on the brain. Uh, this is not only what we have shown through our research, but um, others have also shown that the brain um, uh, tends to uh, engage in um, somewhat of a, what we've called compensatory uh, effort. So it needs to work harder uh, because its efficiency has been impaired through treatment. Um, it needs to work harder to achieve the same level of um, kind of uh, outcome that others without a breast cancer diagnosis um, can achieve but, more readily. So, so with, with your um, the people that you took for your research, yeah, they is it because of the chemo that dumbed down their said uh, uh, that's probably not expressed correctly but to give the the brain full or or is it and all the anxiety that's also Very good there question. yeah um so research has shown that chemo brain or brain fog is real it's a real phenomenon so women first of all they don't they're not lying or un you know un over reporting their lapses in attention memory forgetfulness etc it's real it is not specific to chemotherapy chemotherapy exaggerates chemo brain um an endocrine therapy which involves um uh ripping your body off estrogen um contributes quite heavily to brain fog and sustains it across time. Now, when you are confronted with a um, you know, life-changing event, you experience a lot of trauma. So a traumatic event is an event that has, um, you know, it places a dent on your well-being, on your psychological well-being. It's a big source of threat. So what that does um, in situations like a cancer diagnosis or long term health conditions like MS or you know other menopause, etc. There's a lot of uncertainty associated with how am I going to cope? How is it going to affect me longer term? Will I be able to be the same person as I was before? And these thoughts, these anxiety related thoughts. Also, the, the loss of what you were, who you were, you're grieving for that person. These kinds of, um, these patterns of thoughts take a front seat in the brain and occupy prefrontal yeah, cognitive systems. So they are there dry in the driver's seat, occupying the limited capacity that we have and using up these resources that we may need to attend you know to use to attend to things that we're doing in everyday life okay so this weighs heavy on the brain and because of the level of threat that you experience 
the emotional systems are on fire. So um, you are um, anxious, you know, for example, cancer patients can experience fear of recurrence, um, uh, which is one of the biggest, you know, uh, fears that people can live with daily. Um, and this anxiety, this fear um, is not down-regulated by the prefrontal mechanisms, by the cognitive mechanisms. Why? Because they are, um, uh, you know, uh, cloned with all of these, they're clogged with all of these patterns of uncertainty, negative thoughts, self-doubt, low confidence, low self-esteem, etc. So the brain systems that are involved in regulating our emotions, making us feel in control and empowered to do what we have to do efficiently are not communicating with each other. So that's why we say anxiety and depression weigh heavy on the brain. They not only um, kind of get the emotional systems firing extraordinarily, um, you know, they they also uh, diminish efficiency in the cognitive systems that we need to do what we have to do every day in every and day. I, yeah, and, and I can understand that where you say weigh heavily on the brain because at the, the front of the brain, that's all that you've got there, your normal reasoning power and everything exactly. is, is pushed up. So with your um, research, what... Yes. I mean, I don't think I've asked you that. I mean, how many how many people did you put through the research and what, what were you asking them to do? So we've done a number of randomised control trials um, where we've um, huh. uh, assigned uh, a group or a couple of groups um, to various uh, intervention arms and others who have either been in control groups or waitlist control groups. Um, different studies have had different number of participants depending on the design of the study. So if it's a longitudinal design, you don't need that many participants. You know, you calculate what, how many participants you need uh, for a particular power to detect a sensitive and significant effect. So um, at times we have had uh, 40 participants per arm. At other times we've had 50. Other times we've had 20. If we screened for those who are very highly vulnerable, we've had lower participants because they represent more clinically related symptoms. So it all depends on the sensitivity of the effect. Now, when a particular intervention takes place, um, we usually monitor participants longer term as well. So the intervention might include um, two weeks, two weeks of um, a cognitive training, which we have adapt, you know, it's an adaptive cognitive training. Um, we have piloted, we have used um, various places elsewhere, and we have assessed its reliability and efficacy. Um, so it's not like off the shelf, okay, let's kind of like do this brain training game and, you know, see what we get. No. Um, it could be two weeks, perhaps every day, half an hour, roughly same time um, every day, but it doesn't matter, not too late at night or not maybe, you know, not too early in the morning, whenever that's comfortable for you. And it can be online, done at your own home. Um, you know, when you're com wherever you're comfortable. Now, um, uh, we assess cognitive function and emotional vulnerability before and after the intervention. And we expect to see a change in the intervention arm compared with the control groups. Um, now, from a clinical point of view, uh, change is good, but it's not enough. We need to see how if we have found any change, if it sustains longer term, or if some changes okay. appear longer term. So the idea is that when you're exercising this kind of, um, uh, th th this frontal muscle, if you want to call it that, um, in this uh, kind of adaptive way, it's working with you, right? The training is working with you. You are building uh, white matter in the brain. In fact, some of 
the research shows that gray matter is also, uh, you know, in, induced. And this empowers um, your uh, cognitive systems to kind of override the chemo brain, kind of get rid of, you know, some of all the in inefficiency and the brain fog, um, make you sharper, make you feel more in empowered, make you feel like um, you can remember. Um, and if you have a small lapse, it's okay. Yeah. You you will bounce back. So empowering women using this training um, uh, has has led to not, not only seeing changes um, on you know measures of cognitive performance or what women say on questionnaires, but also when we interview women, they say amazing things are, uh, about how this intervention, how this training has helped them believe in themselves more it's um, a self-fulfilling sort of thing isn't it because I, I suppose it's very similar to like exercise you have to practice the muscle and if you've been through something very traumatic that's all your brain has been thinking about it it's not thought about other things as well exactly so, and you give people that space to actually be able to concentrate Yes. To learn how to concentrate again. Yes, that's very good, the way of putting it. You give them that space, it's their own space, and, you know, um, uh, uninterrupted, and you are giving them the opportunity to exercise those muscles. Oh. Um, now, consistency is very important here. Is that um, that word called adherence? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you said it. Adherence is very key, you know, um, and um, what we have found that the manner by which people engage with the training, so like, you know, you improve on the training, you're getting better and better and better, that transfers, you know, to um, uh, like lowered anxiety, lowered depression, lowered PTSD levels, and one of our studies which found improved workability in women you know women were uh, more confident at work they could stay longer at work they could focus concentrate um, for longer on tasks and um I felt more comfortable going for that promotion going for um you know things that they thought well i'm not quite sure i can do that it's a big step or going for that MSc, you know, that they always wanted to go. But so I think for women, also, when you have cancer, that you, and it's the same for men, but particularly for women, yeah. you go through that thing of the confidence, you know, uh, your, your body's first of all let you down. You perceived your body's let yourself down, yeah. and it's not anything that you could have done. You then may go through losing your hair. You don't look great. All of those things that knock your confidence exactly. huge exactly. and I think also for a lot of women when they have breast cancer which is sort of you know if you're saying sort of between 30 to 50 that's a really tricky yeah. time age-wise absolutely. absolutely absolutely uh getting cancer at any stage in your life is uh, upsetting but especially for younger women who oh. are more out there in society they have younger children um and what they experience is like a threat to their womanhood huh? you know you may go through multiple surgeries you know um, i don't That's want to really true. repeat this word but when many women we do talk about this in terms of our breasts being chopped oh. off or you know the scars are still still there sometimes we hear women say that we're not able to look at ourselves oh. and we yearn for the self we feel we've lost and because this new normal you know the, the new the new normal is like the term that um is used for uh people kind of coming out the other end after treatment for long-term conditions the new normal um is constantly changing we, you know because of all the side effects come you know experiencing we don't know who we are who are we? Are we a better version of ourselves? Are we a worse version of ourselves? Um, are we the same person? We yearn 
for the person we've lost. And this is grief, and grief can weigh heavy on the brain as well, as we know. Um, this feeling is especially pronounced after active treatment ends for primary breast cancer or for other cancers as well. Um, you, you feel like you have lost a big chunk of you. Psychologically, you're not quite sure what's going on. Um, as an example, uh, I remember when I went back to work after my cancer treatment, I was, I was, my confidence was completely shattered. And I remember lecturing, I couldn't hear my voice. I was lecturing. Yeah. And I, I, I'm, I'm going to boast a bit here. I have won awards for lecture, lecture <laughs> outstanding lecture award, etc. But I had to keep checking to see if I've, if I've repeating what I just said, because I couldn't remember what I just said. Not just that, I couldn't hear what I was saying. It was an out-of-body experience, kind of, a, a bit like how you go, how you feel when you're diagnosed. Um, and it took me a long time to get back. to, And also it took me a, a good five years or so to be able to laugh heartedly, you know, like I used to laugh, like from the heart. Okay. You know, it, it, the trajectory of recovery isn't linear we can't expect people to um you know get better 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 no it's like up down up you know a bit like a roller coaster but we need that resilience to not just be able to survive the roller coaster but move with it you know yeah, and to move forward with your life exactly and to move forward with your and, life and did you so was it found that when people did, you know, and I appreciate you had lots of different sort of um, trials going on with yes, people, and people would be at different stages because I know it was at, at, for some it's the beginning of them, for some it was, you know, a while back, Very but they're good. still suffering Very the effects. And talking more to you, I can see how people can, you know, with, with anxiety and, and depression yes. and, and that laughing, what your, your comment yeah. about wholeheartedly you have to be in a place of confidence in yourself true. to kind of let go to have that deep true. laugh true true it, it, you, you've put it so nicely it's about letting go of of that fear you know of of, yeah. of all kind of like this web of emotional you know confusion you're in and be able to laugh you know heart, heartedly you know f from the heart I used to laugh it wasn't like I didn't laugh but it was like from to be able, yeah. oh yeah, I'm not. It's from my yeah. heart. Now, what you mentioned about women at different stages, in all the studies that we've done, we have never found an effect that says, oh, if you uh, do it like you know, ten years on, it's not that much of an effect, or you know, stronger effects of therapy of the intervention will be found earlier after you know soon just soon shortly after active treatment. We've not found that. We have found individual differences um, where coping strategies like suppression of emotions, for example, or you know, people with a history of anxiety and depression um, may need um, a, a more care, a more you know, um, more involvement with, with the intervention. But it's not that, oh, well, you're 10 years, you must have moved on from it now. And no, these interventions can be applied for anyone um, in, with those long-term health conditions at any time, uh, as and when they wish. However, needs to be after active treatment and after um, for primary breast cancer, or, you know, for, uh, for, because with, you know, for, for metastases, um, it's, it's a different matter. Um, what, uh, you know, the brain is more uh, volatile, more malleable, more sensitive when you have, for example, brain mets, uh, you know, um, or so um, you need, you need time you know, to, for, for your brain's been through a lot um, and treatment does affect the brain. So you need to have a few months at least after active treatment um, and then start. 
uh, the interventions. Different times. And what we want to do is to make sure that the interventions we build from now on can be more tailored, can be more targeted, can be more personalized, because one size doesn't fit all. Um, just like any other treatment, basically, yeah. that you've got out there, you know, people try and target it to meet your needs, your individual needs. And we're all different. So we will, um, I know that you've got some exercises and things that we can post along with your article for people to have a look yes, at. Yes, yes. And also I hope that when you start recruiting again, you'll come and talk to us because I'm I sure will do. many of our members will be very keen because, you know, learning a bit more from you, you know, when people may have suffered from PTSD from this, and especially if it was a while ago, they may not have had treatment or the opportunity and just suppressed it yes. all. And it sounds like that your interventions sound quite often like a a, a key to a, to start unlocking a lot of things yes. for people. Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. Um, and no, it's not just specific for breast cancer, um, oh. but for um, why not other cancers? For example, prostate cancer um, share quite you know similar symptoms. Um, and uh, long-term health conditions. Long-term health conditions, um, it, it, it's a bit like, you know when, okay, so with a long-term health condition, this is what happens. You, you are with the trauma. It may have a lesser impact on you as time, you know, goes by. But, uh, you know, when we say post-traumatic, post traumatic stress disorder we are assuming that the trauma has ended physically the event has gone for example abuse it's gone and now you're suffering you're not being abused every day but you're suffering the consequence now with things like cancer and long-term health conditions there's no such thing as a post you know it's different levels okay and you you implicitly carry the trauma with you so this is an additional weight on the brain consistently through time uh. so the the natural tendency to suppress because you need to get on with things right is more you can't say well it's over and done with oh, what if it comes back what if i get worse what if the drugs stop working what if I won't be able to get to my retirement age? All of these uncertainties are there and they're linked to the initial trauma. So it's moving this forward with you, but you need to be able to manage it. And unlocking with, with the exercises, with, with the interventions is a small but good step in the right direction because what you're doing, you are consistently... Um, kind of refreshing your brain you are improving your efficiency and these small you know things do have a cumulative effects longer term you know um, so in some ways people with long-term health conditions um, are, are more can be more vulnerable you know to emotional uh, disorders um and experience them well, when would they say prolonged ptsd or delayed ptsd we see delayed ptsd in various types of cancers why because you the natural tendency is to suppress but then it raises its ugly head 10 years five years along the line and oh it just hits you i've had breast cancer I've had cancer. It's never too late to start, by the way. It's we're not doomed to, you know, well, that's it, we're lost. We've been 10 years in denial, etc. No, it's never too late. And um, you know, uh long-term health conditions, um, you know, that affect the general population, like MS, like menopause. Menopause is a serious thing, oh. and um, you know, you you experience changes either rapidly through treatment for example i remember i went through menopause when i was in my 30s it was chemotherapy induced and it after that it was endocrine therapy sustained you know um 
some people go through two menopauses, once through treatment, and then they go th through another menopause, you know, or they've gone through menopause, and then they go through an another menopause with, you know, treatment. But menopause is another um, example of the changes women need to adapt to, and also a feeling of loss, you know, um, and coming to terms with that loss, adjusting. And the the connectivity I spoke about earlier between the cognitive systems and the emotional systems in the brain, you know, that kind of trans diagnostic is the word we use. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's quite sexy. Trans diagnostic um, uh, pathway applies to all conditions. It's basically the set. It's not. I'm, I'm not going to say the same, but the underlying mechanism is the same. So uh, our interventions um, can work for people with menopause, um, uh, with MS, with other types of lo long-term health conditions that need managing. I mean, we have quite a large MS community, and we've spoken before, before about, um, you know, creating neuro pathways. And for, for MS people, when it is a, a decline, then it is oh. keeping... Um, those pathways open or re-establishing a new one yeah and yeah. and I think but I you know I'd like to end on the note that you said which I thought was very positive is that there is no sell by date for want of a better word is that yeah. you can always start at any time and it's so positive you've seen everybody have an improvement in yeah. various ways and I think the other thing to stress I, I'm aware that we've concentrated quite a lot purely because we're talking about breast cancer for women, but obviously men get breast cancer. Um, oh, wow. and, oh, yeah. and also, you know, you were mentioning about um, prostate cancer as well. So although we have concentrated for women, it is just as applicable to to men, this Absolutely. form of treatment. Well, you know what they say? They say prostate cancer is a bit like the brother of breast cancer, you know. Um, it, it, some of the symptoms that... Um, men with prostate cancer go through and in fact some of the neuroimaging work shows the changes in the brain men with prostate cancer quite similar to you know to the changes oh. women with breast cancer absolutely and men get breast cancer too now because there's not much research done on men um, with <laughs> breast cancer it's unclear if they experience those hormonal changes those you know i mean we talk about breast cancer you know womanhood okay the breasts then you've got you know effects on your sexual function vaginal atrophy you know your physical appearance etc how does this compare to what men go through? Men must be going through experiences. But that's your um, next research then, isn't it? Yes. I think that's what it is. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, well, Naz, thank you so much for your time today. And um, I will be very keen to put some of those exercises up for, to guide people to... I to shall send you links. And um, I, I hope that we get to chat again about some more research. And hopefully I'd love to. with Talk Health, which is, you know, which is an unashamed plug from us. But yes, <laughs> absolutely. I'd love to do that. Thank you so much for Lovely. having me. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.